Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC201 course on Christian history and missions. Um, we're going to study on stewarding revival to host his presence and manifest his glory in today's class. Well, in last class, we looked at the pursuit of revival, where the cry for a visitation and more of God. When there's a prayer that is raised to God with a cry for his visitation and for his move among his people, you see how Lord showed up. So in today's session, we're going to study on how do we steward the re uh, revival? How do we steward the presence of God? And how do we manifest his glory? So today would be the last session and all that we studied so far. Today, we're going to study or look into how we're going to steward this revival. So uh, we are on page 121 from our notes. We're going to look like what God has in store for us. So even before we could begin, may I request one of you all to please uh, lead us in prayer. Roslyn, would you like to pray? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Wonderful Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for this session. Father God, we are gathered here, Lord, to learn from your word. Father God, it is your will, Father God, that you have chosen us, O oh Lord, to be a part of this, this moment, this time, O oh Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord, even as we are studying and getting, know, and getting to know, Lord, your word and especially about the revivals and about the missionaries oh lord and their hard work and what they did lord father god we pray father god as we study them let them let we uh, let us also learn from them oh lord and apply in our lives oh lord father especially as we have come to the end of this this teaching oh lord we i ask you father god to please Bless each and every one of us, O oh Lord, especially our Pastor Nancy, uh, Pastor Diana, Lord. God, I pray, Father God, anoint her today, Lord, as she will teach us from your word. Father God, let every word that we hear be uh, will bear fruit in our lives, O oh Lord, for the expansion Amen. of your kingdom. God, we thank you and we bless you. Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ruslan, for praying. Well, today we're going to look into how we are stewarding what God has entrusted to us. So that may include the spiritual leadership that God has entrusted to us or the mysteries of his kingdom, the way Lord is leading in our ministry. And we also we will look at the gifts that God has given to us. We are accountable for every skill, every talent, every gift that God has put in our hand. We also are accountable for the ministry that God has given to each of us. Because this is not the ministry of what we are building on our own. It is God's ministry. And we are accountable to what God has put in our hands. So when all these things we have, when God has entrusted all these things to our hand, the people, ministry, the gifts, the talent, the skill, now we are accountable to God. Are we handling it in the way it is pleasing God? We need to look at every aspect, the way we handle the skill, the talent, the gifts that God has given it. Is it pleasing God? Am I using it for his glory? We need to check. Because stewarding them is what is more important when it during the time of revival. People, we are accountable to each and every person whom God has added them to our ministry. We are accountable. So we need to handle them with care that they are God's children. They are God's children. 
We need to look at them as a precious child of God and how we can bring correction in them lovingly, how we can restore them back if they have gone astray, how we can you know, uh, make them as a blessing to the kingdom of God. God is looking at us. So good stewardship is not only about managing well what has been given to us, but it also involves in securing it. We need to secure it, multiply it, and pass it over to the succeeding generation. So during the course of time, in our leadership, we need to see to it that we raise good and strong leaders whom we can trust. So we need to look at the journey, how they are managing, how they are leading. Are they trustable to to, to hand over certain tasks to them. So how do we know it? By assigning simple tasks to them. Because the scripture says, when they are faithful in small things, you can entrust them with much bigger things. So we need to see who are those trustable people in our ministry, whom we can assign certain tasks. So that is one of the way how we can multiply our ministry, how we can grow our ministry. Growing is nothing but we raising leaders. By raising leaders, we can expand and we can grow our ministry. Not in the form of securing it, becoming one point of contact. No, that's not the way the church grows and expands. The church, yes, we need to secure them. We need to guard. But at the same time, we need to guard them from the enemy not from expanding the kingdom of God. So we need to be ready to multiply it and raise leaders and expand the kingdom of God. So we must steward the revival, the visitation, and the more of God that God has released in midst of us. So while we are stewarding them, there may be certain challenges that we may face. So there are a few points that we would like to discuss in today's lesson. That is some of the practical lessons that we can learn from the past revival. So that we can apply it in our day, in our time, how we can be successful in stewarding a revival in the presence of God in our church, in our ministry, city, place, where we are heading. So the first one is separating the wheat from the chaff. Separating the wheat from the chaff. Can I request you all to turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30? Can one of you all please read? Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds in his wheat. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tears? He said to them, An enemy has dug us. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while we gather up, the tears also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my pot. Amen. Thank you, Jeffrey. So what we see in this is the owner is aware of the enemy's tactics. It's not something that happened, that came as a surprise to the owner. He knows the enemy statics. He will come and sow the tears. The similar way, the Lord knows during the time of revival, there may be certain fleshly manifestation that would get mixed up in the genuine work of God. So as we have been excited of how the Lord is moving in the ministry, but we need to pay attention to certain things that may not be aligned to God's work. It may look as spiritual, but then it is not from God. So as a leader, we need to be aware of what is happening around us. 
keep your eye open, intentively look at things, what is happening. So when you know there are certain things that are not from God, see how you can execute it. But if then executing immediately at that point of time, if that may affect the move of God or the work of God, but patiently wait, but be have a watch on that. See how they can, you know, a wrong reasons or motivation that may cause the fleshly manifestations. So as a leader, you need to handle this fleshly manifestation with much wisdom, much wisdom. So when you have a team of leaders with you, you can bring them all together, sit and discuss of what is happening. As there's a move of God, there's something not from God is happening among the work of God. So as well, God will definitely give us the way, the reason, or how to move it, or how to uproot it without being affected, affecting the other people of God. So we need to be aware of things even in the revival time. So how should those leaders uh, handle this fleshly manifestation? We need to look, is this the genuine work of God? Is this from God? Is this from the Spirit of God? And when you know it is not, so as a leader, you all will come together and discuss it out, how we can handle this issue or the problem, you know? In a very in a very cautious way, so that others in the ministry are not affected. So this is what we see in Matthew 13, 24 to 30, that it was not uh, uh, though this scripture passage is not given in the context of a revival, but there is a truth that we can draw from this parable, how we can apply it to steve order revival. As you see here in this passage, we see that the owner was mindful of the wheat, that it should not get uprooted because of these tares that are grown. So instead, what he does, he waits, he has a watch, how they are growing. Are they affecting the wheat? Are they affecting the good work of God? He's having a watch. But at the same time, he says, there's a time period. He waits for the right time. He waits for the harvest. And during the time of harvest, he makes sure that his weeds are not affected due to the tears. So he takes the weeds, the right fruit that we are looking for, and then he destroys the tears. So in a similar manner, during the revival, there may be many fleshly manifestations that could appear and disturb the growth or the manifestation of God or the work of God that God is trying to do at the place in revival, in your church, in your ministry. So in the likewise, as just like how the owner handled it with caution, we also should have a watch, handle it with great caution so that the people of God will not get disturbed, so that the God can work in people. So we must wait for people to see the fruit. So what is that? So the Spirit of God will bear the genuine and lasting fruit, while the fleshly manifestation will not so people they themselves will move away because the fleshly manifestation of the man-made things may not last long but it will move off so how do you handle it one by seeing it intently intentively seeing how this fleshly attitude or the manifestation uh, that has been creeped in to the people or during the time of revival, how it's affecting or how you can protect the people of God from this kind of work. One. Second, you see how to handle it. As God's wisdom, uh, uh, come along with your leaders, discuss and see how you can handle it. And, you know, with great wisdom, we need to handle that particular situation so that the fruit, the good fruit does not get affected so that the people of God may not get affected. The second point here we would like to discuss is on stewarding a visitation into a habitation of God.
revival is something like visitation. But then how you, if you steward it well, this visitation of God can become the habitation of God. That means you will have the presence of God for a longer period. Now imagine having the presence of God for a longer period. How you know, it will be a great impact. When I say great impact, not about the signs, wonders and miracles. I'm talking about people being touched, souls being saved, ministry being birthed, church has been raised. The, the revival of God catches fire across the nation and to the nation. The world being impacted and empowered for God. This can happen only through the habitation of God. So every spark of revival or every visitation of revival, the leader should be conscious how I can hold this revival and make it a habitation of God. So God can move and be there for a longer time because that can impact and empower people to raise ministries, to birth ministries, raise churches ministry leaders, because this is what happened in the revivals in the past. So let's read Psalms 132, 13 to 18. Can I request one of you all to please turn to Psalms 132, verse 13 to 18? Anyone from the class, we can save time. There's so much to cover today. Psalm chapter 132, verse 13 to 18. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have decided it. For I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priest with salvation. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But upon himself his crown shall flourish. Amen. Thanks, Jafina. So what we see here in Psalms 132, 13 to 18, we see that the Lord has chosen Zion. What is Zion? God's chosen one, God's chosen people. So God has chosen his people and he desires to dwell, desired it for his dwelling place. So God desires to dwell. It is not we who are calling, but God desires to dwell among his own children, his own people. That's what here the psalmist describes, like that God desires to dwell among his people. So he described what happens when God dwells among his people, a community that is blessed with divine provision. There's divine provision. Providence. They experience God's salvation touching every area of a person's life. That's when a person can be transformed. He can be more Christ like. Why? Because the Lord who dwells there convicts of their sin and brings the change inside out. There's an inward change in the person. Now, what happened? When a person is transformed, he has received Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Now, there's a great joy of God himself dwelling in him. There's peace. There's joy. There's a change from inside out. And you see this person or the ministry growing from strength to strength. Walking in the revelation of God, in the anointing of God. They walk with victory and they triumph in every area because now they have renewed their mind into what God has in store for them. Now, all this can happen in an increasing measure when we have the presence of God, when we steward the presence of God among us.
And for this to grow and flourish and bear fruit, like what the scripture says, 30, 60, and 100, we need to have the habitation of God in our midst. We need to steward. So how do we steward the habitation? How do we make this visitation of God into a habitation of God? When each one consciously make effort to please God in our life, we have the fear of God not to sin. We have the fear of God to do everything according to what pleases God. When we, his children, his people, do the things that pleases God, God stays with us. God stays with us. So the leader should prepare the people well, should till the ground well to hold the presence of God. The leader will ensure that the house of God is maintained well. The dwelling place of God is maintained well that pleases God. So here are some biblical instructions that we would discuss now. The first is keep the house clean. How do we keep the house clean? We're not talking about the physical. Yes, the physical is important and we can do it. But what is more important, the area that none of us see and only God can see is our heart. The house of God, the scripture says that we are the temple of God and the temple of God needs to be kept holy because it's the dwelling place of God. How we cleanse the church when, you know, we worship, oh, this is the worship place of God, we need to clean it, keep it neat and tidy, speak in Spanish. So how it should be our own heart because this is the dwelling place of God. Apostle Paul teaches us very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 to 17. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? And he also says, it also comes with one, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. And he leaves, you, leaves us with a question. Which temple you are? Which temple you are? So it's simple. A leader, we need to encourage God's people to keep ourselves pure. Is it easy? No. Can we do it? Yes. The Spirit of the Lord who is in us will help us and lead us to do the things pleasing to God. How we can avoid? By not allowing the enemy entering, giving him any kind of entry into our, our thoughts, our actions, the way we behave, our attitude. Don't allow any way the enemy to come and attack you. Say, Lord, let me do everything that pleases you. The second point is keep the unity of the Spirit. God finds this good and pleasant. Very important, unity, because the enemy can attack when we are in disunity then we don't have unity among our own brethren, about, among our own leaders in our church. We have to be very careful. As a leader, we need to be mindful of being in agreement, being with one God, being in unity. Even on the day of Pentecost, the scripture clearly says that all of them, all the disciples and all the 120 people who were present in the upper room were with one God. When there is one... When there is oneness, you see the power of God moves in that place. Because there is all in one mind, one God, one desire. Asking God, God, you come and you move in and through us. You are the leader. You are our head. Giving God the first place. So we should know that unity is the place of anointing, life and blessing. Unity is the place of anointing, life, and blessing. So we must work towards maintaining the spirit of unity in peace. So as a leader, we need to strive. If you see there's a person 
who's trying to you know um, bring strife among the leaders among the people bring it to the notice of the leaders bring a correction immediately do not delay in taking certain action do not permit any kind of jealousy any kind of strife backbiting selfish ambitious because this will bring the disunity among the leaders anything that causes the unity to break down as a leader we need to stand against it we should never allow a permit any kind of uh, you know sland uh, slanders to take uh, you know creep into the leadership or among the people as a leader we need to have a watch because the unity is the strength of a ministry of a church so nothing should arm the unity so we see uh, an example in acts chapter 6 where there were a problem of conflict strife but what happened the apostles took a quick address to the problem and they restored the order and unity back so as a leader we need to have a watch and bring correction immediately okay point 3 keep a humble heart god resists the proud very important what does the scripture say we need to humble ourselves so as a leader as a community we need to walk humbly before god and man because this is one of the quality that god is asking us what happens during revival is because everything is going well there's a supernatural power moving in and through you under your leadership maybe it's a natural sense as we are in the human pride can creep into us so as a leader you need to be mindful of not allowing the pride to creep into us but allow the glory to god give all the glory give all the credit to god because every work that has been done in the ministry in and through your even under your leadership give glory to god because god is the one who's doing it god is the one who's honoring you give all the glory to god and guard yourself the ministry against any kind of pride arrogance or any kind of attitude that may think more highly of yourself than any other person we also see in 1 peter chapter 5 verse 5 it says likewise you younger people submit yourself to your elders yes all of you be submissive to one another be clothed with humility for god resists the proud what he does he gives grace to the humble god gives grace to the humble and each of us need the grace to lead the ministry or steward the revival point 4 he talks about keep him as the focus he is the lord over his own house so our focus should be jesus our focus should be jesus because jesus is the lord of this ministry lord of this church lord of this city lord of this community So we see that in Hebrew chapter three verse three to six, we see that in as much as he who built the house has more honor than the house, <clears throat> but Christ has son over his own house, whose house we are. so we need to keep in mind as we experience more of God and His presence, more of His power. more of his glory that has been uh, we get to uh, experience a tangible presence of god in our midst we must always keep our eyes on god because it's god's house it's god who's doing it not man so help us not to set a focus on man but we need to set a focus on god so as a leader you need to be fully conscious of giving glory to god we need to let the crowd know jesus in our midst and let set a focus on god not to take the attention from god unto him personally because he who build the house is the one who owns it isn't it 
So this house, the people, the miracle signs, wonders, everything belongs to God. So let's give all glory, all honor to God. So a strong leadership is very important, but in the leadership, he needs to set the focus right, focus on God and not on himself or any man. So leadership only serves. So as a leader, we need to serve people. We need to ensure that we serve each other, but keeping our eyes on Jesus only. The fifth point we see is continue to maintain prayer that fuels the revival. So the prayer is the backbone of every revival. What happens during revival? It becomes very busy. We try to handle many things. But what we need to do is the prayer. Do not compromise on prayer time. The minute the prayer life is compromised, you see the revival ends there. For us to have the habitation of God in our midst, prayer should continue. If you see in Psalms, uh, very beautifully, uh, um, Psalms David planned to have a worship tabernacle, 24 by 7. He put some 2,000 worship leaders and he had it 24 by 7. So as a leader, we need to come up with a strategy. We need to come up with a plan where there's prayer that is fueling the fire. You need prayer to keep going. So there is a sacrifice that is involved in this. The spiritual sacrifices, the prayer, the worship, the devotion that needs to continue and it should intensify. It should only increase no matter how busy you get in the revival. But we should not compromise on the time of prayer, worship and devotion because these are the one which gives fuel to the fire of revival. Next sixth point, we see that stay with what is important. So God leads the leader for many things. Okay, So God leads us from one season of revival to the next, from one level of glory to the next. There may be some things that we must change. So you, we need to be conscious. We need to look into. We need to pay attention to. So here we see the sound teaching of the word of God, which continues to build each of us through which we get, um, you know, which we see there's a soul winning, there's a disciplining among the believers, there's a good fellowship, there's sharing and caring of one another. And we also see, as a leader, you need to see how you can equip the people, how you can equip the saints on ongoing so that you can release the people, you can raise them as a ministry, you can raise them as leaders to head certain ministry. We can send out people on missions, on outreaches. So all these are essential ingredients of a revival. So as a leader, you need to see what's happening among the people. Are people being equipped? Are there soul winning happening? Is there uh, active evangelism happening? Are there new believers acting into our church? Is there a good fellowship? Do they have a good community among the leaders, among the church people? Are they helping each other? So in intentionally, sometimes we need to see to it that, uh, you know, the people, they are there to help each other. How they can, we sometimes we need to create this opportunity where we bring in the situation and ask people, can you please be there to help this person? And that way we teach and bring opportunity so that people can care and share with each other. And also at the same time, there's something that, should be ongoing, that is equipping, raising leaders and making these leaders to take up and raise a ministry and send people out on missions. So this is one of the uh, uh, key ingredient of a church during revival. So these are uh, something that we need to intentionally do. As a leader, we need to see are all these areas been done, been fulfilled in our church, in our Christian journey. And also during the revival, we need to be very careful of certain uh, areas of manifestation. There may be an angelic visitation. There may be a gold dust. There may be a gold teeth. It can be anything. So no matter what happens, 
maybe maybe uh, you know what happens it can be different ways okay we don't put god's work into a box god can do greater things but our focus should not get into searching for a gold dust searching for the angel or its feather searching for a gemstone or a gold teeth our focus should not be on any of this kind of work but our focus should be are people walking in the intimacy with God? Are people being drawn toward Jesus? Is the focus on Jesus or is it on the gold dust or the manifestation of the work of God? Our focus, no matter which season, which generation we are in, our focus should always be on Jesus and Him alone. Because the scripture says the Spirit of the Lord who leads people will lead them to Jesus not to any of the other manifestation because we see even in the book of acts the apostles when they walked you know peter paul when they walked you see the shadow brought healing to people so there were many people who were coming and you know placing people on the streets so when peter walked there was healing to the people and you also see apostle paul uh, prayed and handed over his handkerchief meant there was healing and deliverance just by touching the handkerchief but then the ministry was not focused on these things no matter how god moved in and through them but the apostles were focused on jesus they still shared the same gospel what they shared before they never changed the gospel of christ so we, no matter how God moves and works in and through us, but we should not accommodate any other thing as our focus. Our focus should still be on Jesus and the gospel, that the work that Jesus did on the cross. We see the seventh point, consolidate what has been released. So the ground gained must not be lost. So God ushers us into a new level of faith, experience of his presence. So we need to understand or understanding of himself, who God is. The revelation of knowing God brings a blessing. The scripture says in, in the book of Daniel, he says, knowing God, my people who know their God can go ahead and do great exploits. So we need to know God. When we know God, we can consolidate. We can we can see what God is doing through in our in and through us. So we must not lose what God is doing in our midst. So in order to consolidate, we need to provide some biblical perspective on what is happening around us. There are two ways. One is the revelation that has been released during the process. And the third that we can see is the manifestation that's taking place. So we need to keep using what has been imparted so that we, we, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't lose it. So wherever appropriate, what we can do is we can document it so that one, we remember and also the leaders in our group, even our successors may remember and know it. So very important in the ministry, in the revival is for us to document what is happening. Very important. Point eight is create and maintain a revival culture to sustain revival create and maintain a revival culture to sustain revival so the culture is the characteristics and knowledge of a particular group of people which is defined by everything by it can be by language religion or the social habits or music arts it can be anything so this revival culture is one that is the presence of God that's focused not on the program or the schedule, but we value God's presence and healed to the moving and leading of the Holy Spirit. So we see that in the book of John chapter 3 verse 8, we recognize the value, the work of the Spirit, even when we do not have all the answers. So in John 3, 8, he says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
So in revival, the culture is one we eagerly expect and we pursue the manifestation of the spirit in a very healthy, edifying manner. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12, we see that even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you may seek to excel. So we need to set a focus when we look at the culture. We need to look that the spiritual gifts are for the edification of the church, that the church may grow and expand. So as uh, as a church, as a community, during the time of revival, we need to have this culture within us where we are hunger for more of God, where we thirst for more of God. This is what we read also in the Beatitudes, isn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will be quenched with more of God. There's the kingdom of God. So we need to, you know, uh, seek for more of God during this time of revival. We should not be in a place of content. We need to pray, pray more, worship, worship more, read the word, win souls, disciple, uh, discipling people. And they should be a passionate towards doing everything. So we need to make sure that God gives us a, gives to us a steel to steward everything well. He gives us the wisdom, the grace that is needed for the leader to steward everything well so that we develop and maintain this revival culture where people and ourselves see God, more of God, something like Moses. No matter how many encounters he had with God, Moses always yearned and thirsted for more of God. The same we see, the same attitude we see with David, we see with the apostles. They needed more of God. They yearned and thirsted for more of God. This is something that we need to develop within ourselves so that we have this revival culture within us. Next, we will move on to point nine. Love people, take care of people. Loving people and taking care of them is more important because people is everything. Ministry is to do with people. People are the key. You cannot do ministry without people in the ministry. So to have people, you need to love them and you need to take care of them. Because even in the ministry of Jesus, you see in Matthew 14, 14, he says, when he looked at the people, the earnest, the thirst that they followed him, you see, Jesus was moved with compassion towards people. Jesus loved them. And because he loved them, you see, Jesus went beyond his ability to do greater things for them. So the ministry is to do with people. We are not here. God has not placed us as a leader to rule over the people, to boss over the people. No, God has raised us as a leader to serve the people. So how do we serve them? Until and unless we love them, we cannot serve them. So we need to come to a point to love people, embrace them as they are. And when you love them, you will take care of them. Everything will follow in place. So we need to know that people are the key in the ministry and ministry is to do with people. Even when you see the weakness, sin, wrongdoing among the people, look out for ways as a leader. Yes, you are accountable to them. But in every area, look up, uh, look out for a way like how you can bring correction in a loving way. It is very important to bring correction. People may like it, may not like it. But as a leader, do it lovingly, with all hearted for the good of the person, because you are accountable. Call them, talk to them, pray with them, speak to them with love. See what you can do. Do your best to them. Even it may hurt them, but what does the Lord do? Love corrects. Love will address the matter out. Love will not uh, bear wrongdoing. This is what in 1 Corinthians 13 we read, right? Love is patient. We wait patiently for the person to change. But whatever we do as a leader, we do it with love. 
we do it because they are important we do it because we are accountable to god we do it because god has a call god has a plan in that person's life and each one of their life so because of that we do it keeping this in mind and when we genuinely do it our heart attitude matters the god who watches with the intention of how we are handling each one of them with the fear of god god gives the understanding to the people he makes the person understand that why we are saying what we are saying 10 leading a revival guard what has been committed from human or demonic attacks leading a revival so how do you lead we need to guard what has been committed from human or demonic attacks so there may be persecution from outside sometimes from inside within your own leaders within your own church people but how do we handle them so leaders in revival will fearlessly attack will be attacked by the other leaders by the people so we need to understand what is happening why because sometimes the jealousy creeps in so as a leader we need to be alerted we need to see the schemes of the enemy how they are entering and what damage are they trying to bring into the kingdom of god because paul instructs timothy in first timothy chapter 4 16 he says take heed to yourself and to the doctrine continue in them for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you the enemy knows that if he can strike the shepherd he can scatter the sheep so the enemy is behind you he may he may uh, uh he may stir the other leaders to come against you now you need to establish your watchman people who will watch and pray to guard what is happening in the spirit so as a leader we need to watch over other leaders who are working with you or under your leadership so we need to watch over them in spirit lest the enemy may use them as an entry point to damage what god is doing in and through you so we need to guard ourselves so how do we guard ourselves we should not quench the spirit of the lord who's ministering into you we need to hear him we need to pray because strife pride jealousy competition and other works of the flesh may grave and quench the spirit of god so we need to guard ourselves from all these things So one of the way, you know, to handle in the New Testament time are fleshly interferences equal to mishandling God's manifest presence. So the spirit of the God, when we quench him, he is grieved. He will withdraw from us. So we should not allow that. We should always pay attention to what the spirit of the Lord is saying and doing so that we can be safe, we can guard ourselves. We may not know what's going to happen next moment, but the Lord is aware. We need to pray in spirit to, you know, to guard ourselves. We need to uh, raise the leaders. We need to encourage the leaders also to pray in spirit. So one of the, um, uh, one of the illustration, one of the example that we would like to take is in the leading revival from the lesson and life of William Seymour some of the things uh, you know he was a very simple man there is nothing that we can talk great about this leader William Seymour in fact when even in the Bible college when we were studying about his life we saw that he was outcast because of his color because of the background that he came from he was not a very well educated man he was not very pleasant in his appearance okay uh, i'm sorry we have crossed our time um I, i'll just leave with this okay uh, though there were many things uh, not very pleasant things to talk about him but he was very quiet gentle and a meek personality but the lord chose him his heart was pure god looks at the heart and the heart attitude so we need to be like that so this is the assignment that i would like to give as your final assignment over the course that we need to 
uh, we need to write, uh, present our assignment this way that how do we steward a revival what is revival all about first question write down please what is revival and how we can steward revival how we can steward revival and you can write uh, uh, about the lessons that you learn from the life of William Seymour Okay, this is about the personality that one should carry that may please God. Okay, about William Seymour. Now, you can also write about the second person. Lessons from the life of Catherine Kuhlman. How she moved with the power of the Holy Spirit, which is much needed for all of us. Though she was a, a woman, how she moved in the ministry. Okay, lessons from the life of Catherine Kuhlman. The third person is lessons from Billy Graham, the evangelic ministry that he moved in. He was more effective in soul winning, how he reached out everyone. So lessons from Billy Graham. So the three people, okay, uh, one is the lessons from William Seymour, lessons from Catherine Kuhlman, lessons from Billy Graham. So mostly on William Seymour is about his personality, uh, what pleased God, about Catherine Kuhlman is how she hosted the Spirit of the Lord and how she moved that realm. And third is about Billy Graham, how we went about winning souls. Okay, three, the strategy. If you look out different messages that is available on YouTube, you see Billy Graham moved with a strategy. From the beginning of it message till the end of the message, the way he preached to put it across people were literally waiting when will he give an altar call when will i run to the stage and receive this jesus that he is talking about you know we need to learn those strategies so that we can apply see these are not a man-made strategy it is a gift from god eloquent of speech is a gift from god Yes, you can train yourself, but I'll tell you, it will flow when it is a gift from God. It will impact and empower people when it is a gift from God. Okay, so we need to seek this. So this is your assignment. What is revival? How we can steward revival and the lessons from the three people, William Seymour, Catherine Kuhlman, and telegram okay done so this is your final assignment this will carry 100 marks so what we can do is y'all can prepare send it across so let me fix a date that you can present it in the class so today is november 4th i've given you this assignment we will present it so you'll have one week to prepare okay we will not have class on monday and on friday so i will take this time for you to prepare and on 14th you can start sharing okay 14th and 18th we will start presenting it in the class so each of you all will be given 10 minutes full 10 minutes okay it is your time so let's take this time to present it okay okay so let's end the session with a word of prayer but before that i wanted to leave a quote with this let me post this quote okay i will read it <laughs> to inspire you to want to be better in one thing but to empower you to be able to be better is the better thing you can inspire from a distance from a stage from the spotlight but you cannot empower from a distance inspiration can come in a moment and can leave in a moment empowerment takes time and it seldom leaves the person. You at the receiving end can be passive while being inspired because it asks nothing of you. You at the receiving end cannot afford to be passive if you want to be empowered. It requires so much more of you. So inspiring people without any empowerment is like getting people excited for a battle without giving them any weapon by Aaron Keys. So I leave this session not to inspire anyone, but what we learn is we need to be empowered. Okay? Okay. 
I think I will end the session. Okay, with a word of prayer, Lord, I submit each one into your hand. I pray that you will move in and through us so that each of us will be empowered by your grace, by your love, by your spirit, by your word and by your spirit, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. So see you all on November 14th with the assignment. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, I would I would create... Uh, the uh, assignment on classwork, I would request you all to post it on the classwork and then we will have the presentation. Okay. Thank you. God bless. Have a wonderful day, weekend.